Good afternoon. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, over the past uh, two days, we have been uh, continuing to hear responses from different uh, individuals and organizations um, about the pension plan design proposal we put on the table, as well as uh, the governance proposal that we put on the table. Um, and just to reemphasize that uh, there's nothing about either of those proposals that should be construed as uh, being a bill that we are uh, trying to push through in any sort of uh, direct uh, time period. Uh, rather, that's um, those were both intended to be starting places for us to have a discussion. Um, so what I'd like to do right now, committee, is uh, spend a few minutes um, not reacting uh, necessarily to the folks who have commented on the governance or plan design, but um, but just uh, I think reviewing what you heard in the two public hearings that we held. Um, I haven't totaled up the number of how many people we heard from, but uh, but I do have the lists over here in front of me. I could I could count it up. But what did you hear from? Um, members of the public who testified, uh, were there themes that you found to be illuminating? Were there misconceptions that you uh, felt we uh, we should identify? Um, so would just like to share for the next 20 minutes or so your reactions to the public hearing. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, heard a lot of compelling testimony, certainly heartfelt um, and uh, very compelling in that um, I, I feel people were concerned that uh, their, their futures were, were being uh, changed in ways they weren't, um, weren't very happy with. Um, and, and I heard that really clear. Um, some of the things that I heard, though, uh, include, uh, I would suggest, uh, almost complete lack of confidence in the decisions being made in investments. And, and that's why I think this governance structure, we, we, we would do well to go forward with. I think we need to do something to restore that confidence, even if it means cleaning house completely. Um, the other piece of that that came through is that uh, people really believe that it was legislators time and time again, there was a belief, not based on fact, because obviously there are no legislators on that board, but somehow or other, uh, there's a belief that has come to, to, to be in very intelligent people for the most part. Uh, that it's legislators who are at fault for the decisions of that. And I think that's adding to the lack of confidence that people have in that. Uh, I feel we have to address that. We have to try and restore confidence in the decisions of the, of, of the board. And uh, the, I, I fully endorse moving forward with, with um, uh, this governance structure changes and, and, and education for the participants in that, so they know who are, who is that exactly are making the decisions, and not just necessarily so they don't think it's legislators doing that, but who in fact are making those decisions on their behalf. Uh, that's one of the pieces that really came through for me. And the other piece is, uh, I'll I'll conclude with, uh, I've been to a number of hearings, and and they're usually very emotional, and sometimes people aren't as articulate as they might want to be. But again, uh, I think these, for the most part, were wonderfully art intelligent and articulate people, and, the, and their testimony reflected that. It was very well prepared and, and well presented. Other thoughts, reactions to what we heard at the public hearings? Mike McCarthy. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll echo a lot of what Representative Merwicki said. I mean, we clearly people are very frustrated. And I something that I noticed was there seemed to be a lot more frustration about 
the potential length of time, additional years that, that employees would have to work, yeah. uh, that that seemed to be the, the biggest consistent point of like, this is a non-starter. If we need to do something, don't do this. Um, heard that loud and clear in my conversations with uh, individual teachers and state employees from my district over the weekend. Um, but I did hear openness in a lot of the conversation to things like maybe increasing contributions if, if we're in this idea of kind of a fair share and who has paid their fair share is a big theme that we keep hearing. Um, you know, I, I think we've heard a lot of testimony about the difference in the contribution rates across the systems, um, the, the issues of equity and, and fairness within the different pension programs. Those are things that I'd love to continue talking about and, and exploring and hopefully, you know, with representatives from the unions. Um, and I also uh, think there was a there was a conflating of the historic underfunding of the past. You know, we've talked about, you know, the the tens of millions of dollars during the 80s, 90s, maybe early 2000s even, where the ADAC payments weren't made in full and, and the underfunding, and it's really the state not funding those things. And I want to own that to a certain degree, but I also want to contrast that with, you know, last year, the year before that, I mean, the past decade plus Vermonters, all of us, including teachers, state workers, like we're, we all are Vermont and taxpayers. You know, we've gotten to a point now where we've spent, I think if I read everything right over the last five years, we've put a billion dollars into the system at the same time when state employees have put about a third of the dollars that the employers have contributed um, over that five year period. And when we look at this year, the budget we all just voted on last week, we're looking at putting 300 million plus dollars uh, into the retirement systems. And, um, and it's you know orders of, of magnitude more than the sort of normal cost um, that we would want to pay in a healthy, well-managed, well-financed system. And so, you know, the, the voices crying out for manage my funds better so they earn more. I totally hear what Representative Rewicki is saying. I agree with that. I also really want um, us to, to continue to look at these issues of equity and fairness and the expectations that people have um, for their benefits in retirement. Thanks, Mike. Mark Higley. Thank you. Um, I guess in even last night's meeting up in uh, Newport, um, the main theme that I that resonates with me, I guess, is uh, uh, folks telling us to slow down the process. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I heard that um, last night as well as uh, the other two nights of testimony. Um, you know, it sounds like they've lost confidence in us as a legislature, whether they had that confidence before, I'm not sure, but they, they definitely are losing it uh, now. Um, I don't know uh, if we can regain that. I, I certainly hope so. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think it was interesting, of course, you always look for bits and pieces that might uh, help your initiative or your thoughts, but uh, there, there was a few uh, that said that, geez, if they knew that we were going to continue to uh, change the defined benefit plan uh, year after year, that they might have considered a, a DC plan. So um, I don't know if they said that out of frustration or if they were sincere. Uh, but again, um, you know, it was it was a it was a crack. It, there was a uh, an opening there to at least uh, discuss it. So. Uh, I guess, again, the biggest thing was uh, uh, the, the lack of confidence, slow things down, didn't, didn't feel that they had the input or that their, you know, union leaders had the input that was needed to get to even this point. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you. I really heard a lot of what I hear Mark saying about slowing down and the complete lack of confidence in the process that has brought us to this point and feeling like people's voices just haven't been heard. I think that I really also heard a real request to, to do our 
again, to really slow down and do our due diligence to examine all the all the possibilities and have all the information before moving forward. And I, I too really want to rebuild that confidence and really know that we're working in conjunction with people. And just from, I, I, similarly to what Mark said, you know, knowing that I too stand in a space of really wanting to make sure that we don't keep tinkering every 10 years and instead really under the understand the full scope and build something better and more sustainable, you know, that certainly came through too, is that frustration that we just keep coming back here. And I don't think we can go forward by continuing to do what we've done in the past and saying, let's change this and let's change that with really not understanding the full scope of, the, of what's going on. Thanks, Tanya. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I didn't have the benefit of hearing um, Representative Merwicki's comments because my dog does not agree with your three minutes bio break framework. He, I think today he said, if you want me, come get me. Um, I, I agree on the equity and fairness piece. Quite frankly, I, I, you know, I've been asking that information from the treasurer's office since before we sat down to talk about this. It's been an ongoing thing. Continued to ask for the information about who's paying what, who's assuming the liability, uh, where it's all coming from. And although I've heard rumblings that it's coming, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, I, I walked away from the public hearing Monday with a, a fairly light heart because I thought Vermonters voices were going to be heard when I walked into this committee and walked out the next the next day I was dismayed as hell. Um, I, I didn't think that it seemed like Vermonters voices were being heard at all and quite frankly I'm, I'm questioning at this point what involvement the business roundtable has had and why they continue to be back here acting in as advisor to us um, when they really don't have anything to do in the process. Slowing down is definitely something that everybody's talking about. Um, the, the concept of earning more money is a great concept, but quite frankly, you heard this morning from one of the most recognized experts in governance that is running around in our country today, he laid out clearly what Beth has laid out several times. If you want more earnings, you have to have more risk. If you have more risk, you're gonna lose more. If you want the VPIC coming back to this body, the legislature to say, we need more money because we took more risk and we lost it, that's the other side of the coin you're advocating for. Um, we got a, an answer to a question this morning that in terms of an evaluation that this individual from RVK did, we are operating under best practice. The people who it said don't know who are running the things happen to be the same people that have the ability to elect the people that are running things. We hold an election basically every two years for retirement board and every three years for BFIC members. Since I don't know, and since uh, it, it was clear <laughs> through the, the hearings that there are a lot of people who are um, beneficiaries of the system who don't know, can you just run through a little bit about how that works on the state side? All right, let me make one more comment. DC plan, um, I imagine they would have the same comment, Mark, if you changed their, your contribution match on them in the middle of the process. Um, the Governor appoints half the retirement board, the state workers or the teachers or the municipal employees do the other half of their boards. Uh, it's done on, there's three members plus a chair. The state board is a little bit different because we drag Roger in from sort of an unaffiliated retiree organization. Everybody else that comes forward to the retirement board has to be an active employee. Uh, they get elected at the annual meeting of the Employees Association. Um, that's the forum. But anybody that is a, a member of the plan has the ability to come forward and put their name in. So like when uh, the state cop agency president said he would like to have a seat on the, the thing, Plan C, Plan C members have had seats and it has been a Vermont State Police officer up until, 
I'd say probably a year ago when the last one resigned. So basically all they need to do is come to the meeting and put their, put their name in. The, the treasurer runs the teacher's election because they are so diverse. They don't come together in one meeting. It's, it's basically school district, school district, school district. So it's basically a ballot process. Uh, the individual boards then elect from the membership of the board they sit in election and move somebody into VPIC and an alternate. Uh, so three VPIC members come forward, one from municipal, one from uh, teachers, one from the state employees with an alternate goes with them. They match the treasurer's office, a couple of members from the governor's office and their alternates. And that's how the quick thumbnail, everybody gets to where they are. All right, so if I were a teacher, I would keep my eyes open for um, um, a communication from the treasurer's office because the treasurer's office uh, conducts that election. And if I were a state employee, I would go to a meeting. Every state employee, and I don't know this 100%, but every teacher, there's a notice published uh, that it, there is going to be an election for retirement board members. Thanks. That's and helpful. I, I think that every teacher gets an actual ballot, but I would have to check with Beth. Specifically. I, I think I heard that as well. Okay. Tanya, so it's, yeah, so it's like, I mean, it's really like everything else that we do. Nobody knows what happens behind the curtain until they're impacted by it. And then they want to know what happens behind the curtain. Thank you. I think Hal had his hand raised before I did. Well, there we go. Ladies before gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a quick, and it might be a Bob question actually around the VPIC. The VMERS board also has membership there, correct? That's municipal board. Okay, so it's a separate board or they do get a seat at the VPIC table? Um, the, uh, thanks for that question. That probably deserves a little more repeating. Uh, the three boards have jurisdiction over certain things of their own. Everybody gets a seat at VPIC. Um, but the, the three boards also, I mean, I, I brought this up once before. They do business <coughs> like managing an, a, a DC, an, an alternative DC plan. They manage the applications and processing for disability retirements. Um, they do the com composition of the funds for a DC plan. They, they have a lot of business that, as the man talked about this morning, is not managing money. It's administrative stuff. So there's a pretty good firewall between those two. Okay. Because one of the things that I have heard, and I wonder if it makes sense to bring some conversation to this committee, is that under the government, and this was from someone who's on the municipal, in one of the municipal boards, and she said that she reached out to me and really pointed out that under the governance structure on the table, the VMERS board may have to consider sort of leaving the VPIC. So I think that they may be a voice we need to hear. Excellent point. I heard that also. And that's because the proposed structure, uh, instead of moving three people forward to the board or the sub board that makes the investment decisions, there were only two people going forward. So the possibility that one of the groups would have been left out of that process um, was what is real and it's, it'll happen because there's only two chairs and three people and from our childhood musical chairs, you know what happens with that. She had some additional concerns as well, just with the structure. So I just, I realized that that's a board that sort of stands to be impacted by this piece of the puzzle that we haven't really heard from. They're the smallest board and they, they're not state, so bada bang. Hi, Madam Chair. Hi. <laughs> would so you like to assume control? We, we, yes, I, I kind of would, and I would welcome you two to grab a cup of coffee, um, but, <laughs> but I do want to make sure that everybody on the committee has the opportunity before 4.30, when sorry. many of us have to leave for other meetings, um, to share any reflections they have on what they heard uh, uh, in during the public hearings. So. Um, definitely carry on that conversation another day. Hal. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, 
I, I agree with what's been shared, um, in particular the time issue, which makes me wonder, is there any way that there can be given some time for some components of what needs to be changed? And obviously we need to be urgent about making changes to stop the bleeding. But I guess for me, what I, what I didn't hear in the testimonies um, was the whole notion of oversight. You know, like, had there been oversight, real oversight, independent oversight, would we be in this condition today? I don't know. But if we're going to be looking seriously at governance, I would think that that should include some form of oversight so that we can be ready to, um, you know, hit the yellow light and, and, and make adjustments so that we keep, keep out of the, the abyss that we're now in. Um, and I'm even wondering if here in state government, you know, with the JFO being an independent, nonpartisan body, if that might be a home for a pension system committee that has oversight responsibilities. Mm. So, yes, we have to get out of this mess, but how do we not fall back into this very stressful, complex situation that we're in now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's uh, keep chewing on that question. Uh, Peter Anthony. I, I uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I agree with Hal about the um, uh, seeming lack of, that we heard at the hearing, seeming lack of uh, um, accountability, oversight, and Hal's perfectly right. I, in one sense, it's an easy fix because we, we have to insist that the legislature and, and by name government operations appropriations both receive annual check-ins how's the fund doing is it meeting its goals uh what's the uh actual actual rate of return um you know things like that what's the funding ratio um i i don't know if you folks who have served on the committee uh had ever uh, gotten directly a, a, a report stuck under your nose but i think hal is right i never had a sense have not had a sense uh, that there was a purpose, a purposefully designed chain of custody of the how are we doing report. Unlike, for instance, from tax and from PVR, there's a there's a January 15th clockwork. There's a report uh, that comes out of uh, PVR on uh, all the uh, uh, tax expenditures, et cetera, et cetera. And that gets delivered to Ways and Means, no question about it. I'm not sure that that's happening in respect to pensions. Now, let me say a couple other things. With all due respect to Mike Maricki, I, I just, I, I agree that the hearing produced a sentiment of we have no confidence. But at the same time, I think it's already been noted, there was a, um, a clear misunderstanding of how the oversight process is peopled by stakeholders, union people, and not the legislature. So the lack of confidence comment, I have a hard time um, uh, channeling, I guess is the, the word I'm, I'm searching for. So unlike Mike, uh, Representative Marigi, I, I really think we do need to tinker, and I say tinker, with the VPEC board, uh, as the gentleman this morning warned, I'm not sure relying on, on a gubernatorial uh, appointment process is really good for continuity, for uh, length of years of service, commitment. Um, uh, his word, he kept using the word continuity. I agree with him. I think we have to think beyond that. Uh, you could tell I was curious to try and prod him about the role of the treasurer in this because she's the common link between the legislature and the boards but that doesn't seem to have worked uh, terrifically well in my opinion uh, but he didn't bite so i'll let that one go uh, i definitely think we have to abandon the teachers requirement that they um, stick around till age 67. i think there's room to maneuver 
uh, on contributions, there's room to maneuver on a more surgical approach to colas, and um, average final years of service. I, I think those are all worthwhile. I want to support the treasurer on some of the levers she identified, but I'm not sure I'm willing to go as far as she went in articulating hers or indeed uh, our benefit change that uh, yourself and the vice chair uh, presented to us last week to chew on. Uh, there's, there's some things I support in that, some things I heard at the hearing that I think are over the top and probably unacceptable and are just um, inflammatory, I guess is the way to put it. Uh, so, but I'm happy to talk more about that in detail whenever you want. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Sam, reflections on thank you. the public hearing. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess through the testimony that I have read and what I heard, the biggest um, insult to injury that I have felt from uh, uh, people that are being affected is that they did not have a choice, nor they still have a choice to be in this pension system it's automatically taken out of their check. They, they don't have no say. And so I, the, one of the biggest cries I hear uh, besides leave us alone is that they want choices um, and they want opportunities. Um, and to me, you know, I, I feel that people should be able to have opportunities and choices. Um, and so I, I know as everyone else has echoed, like, you know, it was heartfelt. I, you know, I sincerely realized the severity that we are dealing with, that these are people's lives. Um, and to me, again, the age, the age factor going, you know, the age factor, as Mr. Anthony has said that to me, it's like a non-starter because I think people's bodies know when they're done. People's minds know when they are done and working because you need to be able to retire and hopefully live a life after that's not acceptable. Um, you, you sign up for something, you know what you're doing. And I would hate to see more on job, you know, accidents or incidents because people are, you know, they, they shouldn't be there. Um, and so I, I appreciate that this is the starting point. I definitely appreciate the availability for more proposals to be coming forward tomorrow or ideas of where to pull, uh, pick and choose from, you know. Um, so I, I thank you for this, uh, Madam Chair and Vice Chair. Thank you. Great. Um, Bob, last word, uh, since I'm now two minutes late for my 4.30 meeting. Um, I, I'll cut to the chase then. I think the treasurer puts a good report out every year. God knows where it goes. I know part. I know it comes over here virtually. I know it goes to the governor's office. I've read them, and I think they're still listed on the website. But uh, that's all I have to say about that. That's all I have to say. Period. All right. Thank you all for your good work today. Um, we have uh, an interesting morning tomorrow, a little bit of um, popcorn of uh, many, a, a slew of different ideas that folks have uh, chosen to put on the table in front of us. Um, some in response to the ideas that, that uh, John and I put forward, but others um, just uh, out of their own experiences and, and, um, and sensitivities and sensibilities. So uh, look forward to tomorrow's um, uh, listening session. I have not factored in a, a break from your computer tomorrow morning, um, but I'm hoping that since we scheduled these in 30 minute blocks that we will find one that gets done a little bit before 30 minutes so that we don't end up staring at the screen for three hours straight. Um, thank you. And I will see you all in the morning.